Alrighty, welcome back. Um, we're gonna talk about implications, which I think is very, very, very important because most mathematical statements, most mathematical theorems is in the form of an implication. So you have seen this in the previous video, um, the if-then statements. Most mathematical theorems um, or mathematical statements have the following form. If statement P is true, then statement Q is true. We also sometimes say P implies Q, or we write with this double arrow notation, P implies Q. You can also read it as P is a sufficient condition for Q, or Q is necessary for P. Oops, I forgot my quotation mark there, excuse me. Okay, and um, you can also actually write uh, like this, uh, statement, let me write it here, statement Q is true, if statement P is true. This is also fine. Uh, there are two notions here that we need to, um, we need to make. Uh, in the case that P implies Q, uh, the statement P is called an assumption or a hypothesis. And statement Q is called a conclusion. So really, when we say P implies Q, what we are saying is really, uh, if the hypothesis is true or the assumption is true, then the conclusion is true. I will repeat that mo one more time. P implies Q means that if the assumption P is true, then the conclusion Q is true. Okay, here's the main idea of implication. P implies Q says nothing about the truth values of P or Q. Let me repeat that one more time. That P implies Q says nothing about the truth values of P or Q. Let me break it down. There are three possibilities for P implies Q to be true. P is true and Q is true. P is false and Q is false. And lastly, P is false and Q is true. Um, it's important to note that we cannot have this case, that P is true and Q is false. Why is that? Because when we say P implies Q, and if we have that P is true, by the meaning of implication, we say that Q must also be true. right? So this possibility cannot happen, that P is true and Q is false. Again, because uh, in an implication, if we assume that P is true, then Q must be true. Okay, uh, so that kind of capture also um, possibility number one, right? It's the meaning of implication. Um, what about two and three? They look a bit funny. Um, number two uh, actually is, uh, it kind of makes sense, right? Um, if P is false, then Q is false. It, it kind of makes sense. But maybe let's take a look at an example. Right. Um, I can have, for instance, P is the statement 1 equals 2, and Q is the statement um, 4 equals uh, 5. Okay? So both are false statements. This is false. 1 is not equal to 2. This is also false. 4 is not equal to 5. But we can um, have the following, that if uh, we assume P, which is false, and we add two to both sides, excuse me, three to both sides, um, then we get one plus three is four, and two plus uh, three is five. So we can have this possibility that a false statement implies a false statement. Okay, but what about uh, that last one? P is false and Q is true. Can a false statement imply true statement? Actually, yes. Let me demonstrate with an example. Okay. Um, 1 is equal to negative 1. This is my P. This is a false statement. Right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to square both sides. Okay. And then what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting is that 1 is equal to 1, which is a true statement. Okay. So I start with a false statement and I get a true statement. Um, this possibility can also occur. Right? So false statements can imply true statements. Um, in fact, 
using just one false statement, we can prove anything. But that's not really what we're going to talk about here. Okay, so let's now summarize all of these um, four possibilities or non-possibility in that last case um, in a truth table. So this is how the truth table of implication look like. True, true, false, false. True, false, true, false. Um, when P is too true and Q is true, this possibility can happen. Uh, when P is false, Q is true, that possibly can happen. Uh, the last one also can happen. The one that cannot happen is the one in the middle, right? And this is the truth table of an implication. Okay, so let's go, uh, go through them one more time just to emphasize uh, everything. Remember, P implies Q. What, what are we saying? We if we assume that P is true, then Q is true. Therefore, the first line uh, is obvious. Uh, if the hypothesis is, the assumption is true, then uh, the conclusion is true. It cannot happen that the uh, hypothesis, assumption is true, that the conclusion is false. Therefore, um, the uh, truth uh, value for P implies Q in that second line is false. The last two is essentially what we mentioned earlier, right? If you assume, if you start with a false assumption, then Q can be anything, right? It can be true, it can be false, it can be anything. All right. It is very important to also know how to negate an implication. As I mentioned in the beginning, most mathematical statements are of the form P implies Q. And often we need to negate the statement. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, before uh, I mention how, what is the negation of an implication, uh, here's an exercise for you. Show that P imp implies Q is equivalent to the statement here, not P or Q. Okay, so show that P implies Q is equivalent to not P or Q, okay? Uh, you can use a uh, truth table for that. Now, if we know that uh, P implies Q is equivalent to not P or Q, then if we want to negate P implies Q, right, it's the same by taking the negation of this guy right here, right? And we know how to negate a statement with or. We use the Morgan's law, right? So what is, uh, let me write it maybe in the bottom here, what is the negation of not P or Q, right? Uh, this is equivalent to, remember the not sign goes inside, it attaches itself to the first one, so we have not not P, or becomes N, and then not Q. But remember also that not not P is equivalent to P, right? And the rest uh, is the same. So the negation of not P or Q is P and not Q. Therefore, the negation of not P implies Q, which is equivalent to that, is P or not Q. Okay, the negation of P implies Q is P and not Q. Okay, let me uh, write uh, a statement and let's look at its negation. If A and B are non-empty sets, I'm just gonna use a shorthand like that, then A intersection B is also not empty. Okay, how to write the negation of this statement? Okay, so this is P and this is Q. The negation of this statement, let's call this statement maybe R, right? The negation of R is P and not Q. So P and not Q. Okay, this last one <laughs> that I just wrote, it's a bit funny, right? That's not how we want to uh, we want to write it. Not A intersection B non-empty, right? What what are we saying is that actually uh, A intersection B is not empty 
cannot happen, right? Or doesn't happen. So what we're saying here is that uh, better perhaps to write it as follows, that A intersection B is empty. Okay, um, statement R is actually false. Okay, statement R is false. And typically when we want to prove a statement to be false, right? Uh, that, 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 that this statement is false, we need to find an example such that um, showing that the statement is false. So what we're doing is finding an example such that its negation is, um, holds, okay? So in this case, um, for instance, if A is whatever, right? Uh, one, B is negative one, uh, A intersection B is non-empty, uh, is empty, excuse me. Okay, so um, this is called a counter example, right? So suppose somebody tells you, is it true that if A, B uh, is non-empty, then their intersection is also non-empty? Um, and uh, you said, okay, that is, that is a false statement. Then that person will ask you, okay, if it's false, what is the counter example? Then you give this example right here or another example that works like this as well, right? Just find two disjoint sets. That's basically um, what, how you do it, right? And uh, this is called a counter example. All right. Okay, I'm going to end this video with three, actually four, uh, notions concerning an implication. Given an implication P implies Q, the inverse of P implies Q is not P implies not Q. So just attach a not there. The converse of P implies Q is Q implies P. The contrapositive of P implies Q is not Q implies not P. Uh, you may not hear about inverse so much um, in, in your mathematics courses, but certainly you will hear a lot about converse and contrapositive. Let me first start with contrapositive. Um, the contrapositive of P implies Q, again, is not Q implies not P. And this is extremely useful because P implies Q is logically equivalent to not Q implies not P. These two statements are equivalent. And this is extremely useful because sometimes when you want to prove P implies Q, it's easier to prove uh, it's contrapositive. So in that scenario, uh, you prove this first and then you use the fact that they're logically equivalent to deduce that P uh, implies Q. Okay, we will put a pin on that note, on that fact, and we're going to talk about it again when we start with our method of proofs. Now, about converse. P implies Q, the converse of P implies Q is Q implies P. You will hear this a lot in class when your lecture present a, a theorem, for instance. Uh, if P implies Q, is it true that Q implies P? Uh, very famous example from calculus. If a function is differentiable, then it is continuous. The converse is not true. A continuous function is not necessarily differentiable. An absolute value um, is, the absolute value function is an example of that, okay? So there are instances where P implies Q but the converse is not true, like what I just mentioned, right? Differentiability implies continuity, but it is not true that continuity implies differentiability. But in the case that P implies Q and Q implies P, then we shorthand this whole thing as P if and only if Q. So we read this as if and only if. Or we say that uh, P and Q are equivalent. Okay, so with this, um, I'm going to end the section on implications. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about quantifiers. And then we're going to start with method of proofs after that. Thank you for listening.